thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today at our third and final event as part of the Digital Asset Trading and Technology Series. Today, we have the pleasure of introducing an absolutely rock star panel of experts to discuss the booming landscape of crypto asset management. This panel will dive into the current ecosystem and opportunities for digital asset management and consider what the future of managing crypto assets may entail. My name is Alyssa Ostrove. I'm the Chief of Staff at Crypto Compare, a global leader in digital asset market data and indices. We have partnered with Blockfills and Copper to put on this three-part series. I hope you've been able to join our prior sessions on prime brokerage and institutional mining. Um, if you haven't, you can find the full videos on Crypto Compare's YouTube channel. Today, we have a panel from some of the biggest names in digital asset management. Collectively, our panelists are responsible for more than 9.2 billion in assets under management. Moderating today's discussion, I have the pleasure to introduce James Bennett. James is the CEO of the ByTree Group, a Bitcoin data company who provide research and asset management services for Bitcoin investors. Their flagship product is the ByTree Terminal, which is used by thousands of hobbyists and investors looking to generate alpha trading strategies for Bitcoin. ByTree's asset management business currently runs the Bitcoin in General Fund and recently launched the world's first exclusively Bitcoin and gold index, which is available on Bloomberg. I'll leave James to introduce the rest of our panelists, but I do want to remind everyone that this is a live discussion. So we will be taking questions throughout the session. Um, please feel free to write in. There is a Q&A function on Zoom that should be at the bottom of your screens, um, but we'll try to keep this as interactive as possible throughout. So thank you all again for joining. I'll now turn things over to James to lead our discussion. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Good afternoon, good day, everyone. Um, yes, today we're going to be talking about asset management uh, within digital assets. Who are the biggest players? Well, we have some of them here today. How are investor demands changing and what does the future of asset management look like? As Alyssa said, we are very lucky to have a panel today that manage over $9 billion in digital assets and have really been instrumental to building up to this um, in excess of $2 trillion industry that we see today. Uh, so quick bit of housekeeping, you can do uh, ask questions by dropping them into the Q&A uh, panel at the bottom of the screen um, and we'll take those questions uh, as we get towards the end. So last bit before we dive into the panel is to have our wonderful panelists introduce themselves. I'll first hand over to Boris. Thank you very much, James. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Boris. I'm one of the partners and uh, the Chief Revenue Officer, Copper. Um, some of you will be familiar with us already. We are a custodian uh, settlement and clearinghouse as well as sub offer prime services for by now around 280 clients globally, um, around 150 to 160 crypto funds, um, as well as market makers, uh, prop shops, HFTs, uh, and so on. Um, by now, roughly scratching at about 10 billion uh, of assets that are sitting with us. Um, and uh, yeah, pleasure to be on this panel and looking forward to a, a fruitful discussion. I'm going to play the role as the boring infrastructure guy, but I hope I'm going to bring some insight to you guys. Thank you, Boris. Uh, Mr. Masters. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So I'm Danny. I'm the executive chairman of CoinShares. Um, now we're, we're well known uh, as sort of the first and, and currently the largest uh, digital asset manager in the crypto space in Europe. Uh, we launched our first product in 2012, <clears throat> um, so pretty early, um, and we became you know our first listed product in 2015. Uh, CoinShares is also very active in the trading business. We're doing you know, pushing 30 or $40 billion a year annualized now in, in market making uh, across a number of the major exchanges. It's part of our business that we're less known for. We're also serial investors in many of the companies that currently populate the uh, digital asset ecosystem uh, from data companies to exchanges, wallets, miners, you name it. And, um, and we went public back in March uh, on NASDAQ OMX in Sweden. Uh, I think we currently have a market cap of around 900 million um, uh, as an equity valuation and um, everyone should go and buy it, it's still cheap. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Danny. Um, Chris, over to you. Fantastic. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Christopher Matta. I'm the president of 3IQ US. Uh, 3IQ is a digital asset manager primarily uh, focused out of uh, Canada, but is currently in the process of uh, global expansion. Uh, we're most well known for being the first uh, to launch a regulated exchange traded product in North America. Um, and since uh, that launch back in early 2020, we've launched a whole suite of ETPs and ETFs in Canada for the digital asset space. And today we, we manage around uh, $3 billion of, of uh, 3 billion USD worth of, of uh, AUM uh, across our products as we're continuing to expand uh, globally. Brilliant, thank you, Chris. Uh, and over to Hani. Hello, um, ha uh, I'm Hany Rashwan, one of the two co-founders here and the CEO of uh, 21 Shares. Uh, we have the world's largest product suite of crypto ETPs, something like 65% of all listed crypto ETPs in the world are ours, including the world's only um, indexes and baskets, uh, the world's only uh, short, uh, we have a Bitcoin short, as well as I think now 12, crypto assets that you can only access on the public markets through our product. Um, about to cross 2 billion in, uh, in total AUM and a couple years old. Fantastic, thank you, Hani. Um, so let's kick off this uh, panel by talking a little bit about the different types of investors that we're seeing uh, come into the industry uh, at the moment, because you know there are lots of different asset management vehicles out there. So. Who wants to sort of uh, kick us off by, uh, Hani, perhaps you can talk about that sort of uh, investor base that you're seeing at the moment and maybe how that's changed in the last six to 12 months. Absolutely. So we've always from the beginning, um, back, back in 2018, when we created the world's first physically backed crypto ETP and first index, been geared towards retail. We wanted to make sure that our products were priced at a retail level. And we thought that retail should um, deserve uh, institutional grade products. And that's been, that, that's been what we were targeting primarily because that's where the market is at. Over the last six months, I would say in terms of net new creations, new shares, we started seeing a lot of bigger tickets, which uh, should probably uh, mean something um, about family offices and private banks and individuals coming in uh, and doing more than just dipping their toes. I still think it's early. Uh, the institutions are, are, are absolutely not here. The large pensions and insurance companies are absolutely not here, uh, but we have started seeing some serious interest from uh, what I would say are fund managers, uh, family offices, private banks, uh, in, a, in a way that we haven't seen over the past couple of years. And still, to, to be fair, very strong retail demand still. But in addition to that, we started seeing some um, family offices, uh, ultra high net worth and private bank kind of class. Yeah, and I, I think to add, you know, a lot of the institutions that are now getting involved, one of the primary reasons is because of the fund structures that, you know, 3IQ, 21 shares, CoinShare, all of these types of firms that have these ETPs that are regulated and more easily accessible. Many institutional investors, whether it's a private bank or you know broker dealer platform, don't have the infrastructure or haven't been willing to build the infrastructure to get exposure directly to the underlier. And so, while retail maybe was a, a little more willing to move and and um, and and figure out how to buy Bitcoin themselves and and other digital assets, uh, ETPs is a regulated are regulated products that make it easier for some larger institutions to get their compliance and legal folks comfortable with owning the asset class, right? The, the regulated nature of those products, I think, uh, get, brings that additional level of, of comfort. I can also add to this, I mean, from, from our side, uh, um, it's a little bit uh, interesting conversations that we have around this, especially when it comes to ultra high nets and family offices, which is a rising number when it comes to holding Bitcoin physically and starting to play around with this. There is, however, in all those conversations, always a question in and around, you know, where can I buy 
a basket or an index accordingly that kind of diversifies it a little bit you know dipping the toe in now on the bitcoin side is something that seems to be very mainstream also with the institutionals uh there is still a long way to go no doubt but uh the interest on the other side to hold a uh, um an etp like product uh that basically does things that you don't necessarily want to actively manage yourself um is of very high demand at least from our perspective what we can see um so kind of doubling down what uh, uh, both guys said yeah and i think package the other thing is the etp packages the infrastructure together right so it, you get best in class custody you get best in class trading and execution uh, uh and uh and fund administration and tax all of these things that are bundled into into one product it just it just makes it more convenient for both retail and institutional investors to get exposure to the asset class versus building out that infrastructure themselves which everyone on here knows you know the the crypto infrastructure is uh, you know is unique and there's a lot of friction associated with it and and it does take time to get up the curve uh, especially for institutions to to build out that infrastructure absolutely so i think a little bit of research before uh, joining or running this webinar today you guys collectively manage over 100,000 btc so um, over 6 billion dollars just in bitcoin um, we've seen over the last month or so that Ethereum has um, started to take uh, the flag from Bitcoin in terms of returns. Danny, you've had one of the longest standing Bitcoin and ETH products in the market. You know, how are you seeing this sort of shift in interest at the moment um, from you know, the institutional uh, Bitcoin conversation to now there seems to be more of an appetite across you know, the other assets within the industry? Um, it reminds me of a conversation I had with Edwin Schooling Latter, who's the director of policy at the FCA. And as people on this call probably know, the FCA is sort of in reverse when it comes to the adoption of crypto assets. And they actually issued a new, you know, the latest dire warning today. Um, and his opinion, which was striking, was that Bitcoin had no fundamental value and that uh, there was no utility in Ethereum. Um, now, I don't know how much more mistaken you can possibly be. And I'll tell you what's happening right now, um, which works in, directly into what you're saying, what you're asking. Number one, the crypto universe has a different funding mechanism from the traditional universe. And anyone that's tried to send their crypto profits to HSBC or being kicked out of a bank because they do crypto or can't get a bank account because they do crypto. I mean, I must have happened to me a hundred times. And so the crypto universe has developed its own funding system. And that funding system, not surprisingly, because people are unbanked and they don't want to go to the other system and, and the returns in various sectors are high, the prevailing interest rate is extremely high. And we're all familiar with what's going on in DeFi, what's going on with stablecoin interest rates and so on and so forth. I mean, our gold token is attracting a, uh, an interest rate of 5.5%, which you know, in the real world would be 20 basis points per year, 30 basis points per year. So the, 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 the whole interest rate structure is different. Now, how do you access it? You access it through DeFi. What do you need in order to access DeFi? You need Ethereum uh, almost exclusively. And I found myself, you know, even for my personal account trading, which, you know, isn't even that much, but I keep running out of ETH because I'm moving, you know, deposits from here to there, borrowing here, lending there, doing some sort of yield farm or some sort of liquidity pool. And I keep having to buy ETH. So ETH is like a really busy highway that charges a variable cost to, to drive your car down it, where there are too many cars trying to get on. That's what's happening with ETH. It's driven by the interest rate environment. And then finally, Bitcoin dominance is going down because Bitcoin is the reserve currency of that different alternative investment ecosystem. And, and as we've seen many times in the past, when alts have a good momentum, Bitcoin dominance goes down. Alts have got more momentum now than they've ever had before. And I think it's as simple as that. And, 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 and what you've got to remember a little bit here is a 10% drop in Bitcoin dominance is a huge magnifier for the DeFi space because a lot of those market caps are a lot smaller, especially in the smaller coins. So look, I, I think Bitcoin and Ethereum are still absolutely at the core. Um, you know, will there be better solutions for Ethereum like Solana, uh, like Tezos, you know, pick a, pick a chain uh, today? Uh, possibly yes, but it's going to be tough sledding beating Ethereum because the infrastructure is so astronomically bigger than anything else. Completely agree. I mean, 
we're discussing this uh, uh, consistently because of adding, you know, layer ones to the uh, MPC library accordingly in order to support them for any asset manager like is a is a, is a key topic right now. Um, and what we have seen over the course of the last year, especially, and I think is going to happen for the foreseeable future is that battle of layer ones who will ultimately come out on top. Uh, um, I mean, we've got ETH version two coming up. Uh, um, we've got Solana in terms of, I mean, whoever ever owned a Solana in order to move it around. I mean, it is mind blowing the speed and the cost uh, uh, in, in comparison to what you incur with ETH. Um, but given the very, very fast blow up on the DeFi side and mainly the, the, the main protocol for this, of course, being ETH, for the foreseeable future, I see this uh, uh, going very well uh, uh, for anybody that is kind of dabbling around in the space. Um, but it will, um, linking back to what Danny said with regards to everything uh, of, on the Bitcoin dominant side, um, it will change, that the, the tide will change with regards to other layer ones being, uh, um, you know, prevailing and enabling uh, uh, whatever is going to happen and be built in this space. So um, definitely something to look at. Uh, also, of course, from the issuance side, uh, uh, um, in terms of what other protocols should be accessible to the wider wider public market. I think, I think it's also worth highlighting that we've seen this kind of alt, alt cycle before, right? I mean, 20, 2017, we, we saw, and, and 2018, we saw a similar, a similar rotation, um, significant Bitcoin growth, obviously a lot of, a lot of profits uh, being, being made there and, and folks looking for a, a alternative investments. Uh, that's not to say that that ether is um, is not extremely viable and has a lot of lot of promise. But I think when you go down the, the market cap list, there is huge appreciation across the board for a lot of smaller protocols. And I think this comes back to what Danny said before, just a 10 percent drop in Bitcoin dominance means huge moves for some of these smaller market cap coins, um, even though some of them, I would probably say many of them. Uh, don't necessarily have uh, their footing yet, uh, or are as established um, as as others like like ETH. So, although um, it, it's been very exciting, um, as we know, the alts are, are going to be extremely volatile o over the longer term. So, um, as as a firm, we have um, really strived to build investable uh, product for whatever argument, whatever invest uh, investment thesis. Um, is out there. Uh, we stand behind the assets that we uh, allow investors access to, but we want to give access to not just the top assets. Um, on the Bitcoin and Ethereum piece, I, I completely agree with Danny. Uh, Bitcoin should be the reserve currency. And that means that over time, um, Bitcoin dominance going down is, is probably a logical thing. Uh, on Ethereum, our research has um, consistently been publishing since the fall of last year that based on what's going on in the Ethereum ecosystem, ETH was, and we would argue still is, pretty undervalued, um, given a lot of the activity uh, that's associated with it. But in addition to that, um, we have an ETP that covers uh, Binance, BNB. We have one that covers Polkadot. Uh, we're working on other uh, ways of accessing layer ones, and we think that there is a world where this is complementary to Ethereum and there's a world where it's absolutely competitive to Ethereum. Uh, and that's going to be a very exciting uh, development to see play out. And, and from our company's perspective, we'd love to make high quality products uh, to allow investors to make bets on these kinds of movements. Hani, if I can just sort of um, add to that uh, with a question, you know, 21 shares have probably the most a diverse range of exchange traded products out there and um, we see what's happening with grayscale in the us continuously adding more and i'm sure you know coin shares and, and 3iq will be adding more in the future too but i expect them not to put words in in their mouths um but just interested you know what the process is for adding new products to your platform um you know something like I'm going to be quite controversial here, but Dogecoin, uh, which is now fourth in the in the market cap, we did touch on it earlier. You know, what, what does it take to add something like that to the platform if, you know, the, the industry clearly sees that it, it has a, a high market cap? Um, so first of all, you would be surprised how many family offices and fund managers have reached out asking about a Doge product. Um, the answer, uh, you know, is, is, is not zero at all. Um, we haven't launched one. Um, we will never say never. And there, there's a, there's a process for it internally. We think about 
the products that we launch is not us making an endorsement of the underlines, but us making the determination that that um, is investable. Uh, and there's, there's a subtle but key difference there. What that means is that we have an internal product governance committee and we have an internal product selection committee that uh, takes a look at what are the teams behind the asset uh, looking for? What are their visions? Is this a build to flip? Does this seem scammy? Who are the teams behind them? Who are the backers? What is the progress that they've done? Um, and sort of how, how have they in the ecosystem um, been, uh, been both perceived and how have they, um, what, what actions have they taken overall that tells us something about the organization? So for example, um, we do not have a Litecoin product, but we have a Bitcoin Cash and, and Ripple product. And if you look at just the market caps, we have a Tezos product, um, a Polkadot product. And I believe Litecoin, for example, in this, not to say anything negative about Litecoin, but in this specific example may have a higher market cap than several other assets we've introduced, but did not pass our selection committee based on some of the inside sales and what was going on with the foundation at the time. Um, and so that's, that's sort of how we go about doing the, this process. As it stands today, we have 14 total products. We have plans to add 30 more. Um, and so this will escalate a lot of the, a lot of this will be uh, new and upcoming assets and new and upcoming strategies. Um, and we, we only make the case that these are investable. We do not make an endorsement of them in any way, shape or form. Um, and that's, that's the only thing is safe, investable, good teams behind them, going after a vision strongly that they mean uh, and, and going after it well, that's it. Yes, very, very interesting. 30 new products, that is quite a, a roadmap. Uh, very exciting for you guys. Um, I just want to now shift the conversation a little bit towards um, this intersection between um, the sort of centralized asset management platforms and decentralized finance. Um, you know, something uh, that was quite notorious in the 1718 cycle in crypto was the sort of lack of liquidity, where orders of a few million dollars would be visible in the price. Um, but, you know, now we're seeing, well, the two part question, really, Danny, this is for you, because I know you, you guys have a big market making uh, desk, um, a trading desk. You know, what does the market depth look like now? And then also, you know, with such a high volume um, occurring on decentralized exchanges, do you see a future or perhaps now um, where, you know, liquidity could be sourced from centralized and decentralized exchanges and it will all be pulled together? Um, that's kind of a knotty question. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's, let's just, let's just go through a couple of things. So yes, decentralized exchanges, you know, predominantly Uniswap have put up a really good fight, you know, even against the really big names like Coinbase. I mean, there are days when Uniswap does more than Coinbase, which is very impressive. Um, and you know, Uniswap has made huge, huge inroads um, into, you know, with a very, very simple idea, which is let's sort of democratize the issue of the, the, the swapping of tokens and not have to pay CC a million bucks in order to get a listing. What a brilliant, simple idea. And, and they've, they've executed that extremely well. Um, but there are, there are problems with this. Um, firstly, is the pr problem of impermanent loss. So these DEXs function with automated market makers in a totally different way to centralized exchanges do. If you've got a single token, you know, just a random project token, you know, race and Ethereum issue, an ERC20 token of some kind, um, and, you know, that's traded on a DEX, well, the chances are that that token is going to be pretty highly correlated with the price of Ethereum, and, and most of them are. The problem comes when you start trying to list US dollars, um, which, you know, which have a very different market dynamic. You know, the market dynamic works exactly outside. And so some of them, you know, there's two things that can go to, 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 to help support that. One, you use an oracle of some kind that, that re-centers the automatic market makers sort of, uh, you know, elastic supply and demand curve. That's one thing you can do. Um, and um, that is one thing you can do. I, thought, I forgot what the other one was. But 
but but the problem there is then as you move more volume into a decentralized exchange if you're relying on an oracle from the outside you're sort of seeing sowing the seeds of your own destruction because at some point you know that oracle is then which used to be an oracle because it was liquid is now not an oracle and it's manipulable and that, that could have serious issues for the decks the second thing is that the the actually when you when you operate on uniswap version two at least you know you'll find that 90 percent of your capital is actually not working because you are making a market essentially from zero to infinity on an ever steepening curve um and while that's kind of elegant from a math perspective it's very inefficient from a capital perspective so you know if you want to be a market maker and you wanted to have a hundred there's a market maker in a centralized the trading activity. So, so these things are, are symbiotic and to a certain extent dependent. But but what you know, I'm waiting to see what what sushi uh, so Universion three is going to be because from what I hear, uh, they are going to localize the they're going to localize the uh, the market making window so that you can increase the efficiency of capital. So it's a really complex uh, infrastructure. But what it does allow for is really innovative financial products like you know index baskets of digital assets that can be self-issued self-redeemed i mean you know we issue and redeem securities all the time this group of people here um this can be done now you know automatically and even the rolling for an index where you're rebalancing constituents can be done programmatically on dexes but it doesn't quite work yet but it's clear that that's kind of the direction of travel I mean, just incredible to hear, you know, the chairman of a listed company with 5 billion of assets under management takes such an interest in decentralized finance and really the technical level details, you know, of what's going on in DeFi. It really does put um, sort of testament to the fact that, you know, you see the future of banking perhaps um, in this decentralized architecture. Um, Boris, I know you guys are doing a lot um, in the DeFi space as well. Um, client driven, as I understand it, you know, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about the sorts of uh, things that, you know, asset managers are, are doing through your, your platform. Um, sure. uh, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are, we are, um, we're very much client driven, like you said earlier. I mean, we, the, the, the platform with all the different products from Walt Garden, Clearloop, et cetera, which, which of course is being very actively used by Asset managers, you know, the buzzword of not having to fund exchanges anymore is a big one. Uh, being able to trade out of custody without any layer two solutions um, is very, very, um, very sexy for a lot of people, um, mainly from the capital efficiency standpoint. And yeah, towards the tail end of last year, um, I was more surprised than anything of how many of our clients are actually dabbling around in the DeFi space. I mean, at that time you had mid last year, I mean, some of the numbers that were flying around were just mind blowing to say the least in terms of yields. Uh, uh, um, but um, we then looked at the space uh, and from an infrastructure perspective, you know, <laughs> custody normally doesn't stand very high when it comes to decentralized approaches. But uh, um, we looked at the solutions that were there at that time in and around, of course, MetaMask is the main thing uh, uh, that, that, that was used. and. You looked into it and then it was like, yeah, that's an online hot wallet. I know that they had planning to bring something out on the on the like an institutional product. And we said, look, we have we have MPC, MPC secured, hot, cold and uh, um, uh, warm wallets. Uh, so cold, warm and hot um, that should be interoperable with those smart contracts uh, across all the different uh, uh, platforms. So we kind of set out in order to solve this uh, uh, with which is Copper Connect, um, it's already, I mean, the first version came out about four or five months ago. There is a big, big revamp happening to this right now um, under the same premise because there are a lot of security <laughs> security uh, uh, issues. Like, like Danny said, you know, you can be wiped out very quickly if you don't do the right thing, depending on what smart contract you are, you're engaging with. There are assets that you, that you deploy at that given time, only a certain portion, but down the line, the smart contract has recourse in order to wipe your whole wallet. So those are all things that you need to kind of be uh, wary about, uh, um, especially if you start doing all this stuff, if you're not as proficient as Danny, for example, sounds. Uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's very, very important that the infrastructure from a security perspective, especially if you want to give it an institutional flavor, is up to the test here. Um, so yes, uh, um, we kind of were joking earlier about this, right? I mean, it's 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 uh, for me it was very much surprising to see 
um, the rise of this uh, um, of this market in that speed. Um, it's definitely not going anywhere, I think. Um, but there are a lot of things that we still have to figure out on the centralized side, in my opinion, before we kind of go fully DeFi. And I, I think it also kind of calmed down a little bit. Um, it's all been taken with a pinch of salt, uh, uh, looking at all those different solutions. And also, you know, you shouldn't be blinded by the money that can be made there. Uh, um, because as quickly as you can make it, there is always a risk attached to it. But yeah, from our from our perspective, um, there are there is a lot of effort that goes into this uh, in order to make sure that any sort of strategy that you want to deploy across DEXs and, and any sort of smart contract interaction is being done from an infrastructural perspective properly. Uh, uh, um, so you can run any sort of strategy and have LPs give peace of mind that their assets are not suddenly disappearing from one day to the other. Uh, uh, never mind, of course, the asset management part of it. But um, yes, we are we are very very active in this uh, in order to yeah supply our clients with what they need. It's an incredibly impressive platform, um, especially for the active asset manager that wants to get you know really technical and and benefit from you know sort of full access across the DeFi spectrum. Uh, and this is an open sort of question to all the panelists, you know, what about the investors that just want to access a bit of yield, um, you know, and they have a risk level that they can define, but maybe they don't have the, the appetite uh, to get uh, very technical um, as, as they would with copper. What, what options do they have today? So I think we've, um, we've built a few income generating products that are super interesting, like on um, yield. Um, generation income generation through staking um is a is a really interesting concept i think um ethereum at some point will have it and i'm sure all of our ethereum products collectively on the panel will start supporting this um and, and giving it back to the investors in some way but we've already um done that with polka dot with um tezos where these are staking assets and on the tezos product that was the first income generating um product that we launched, uh, certainly the first in the crypto space as well. There's some very um, cool things you could do on yield farming and, and the like. I don't know that anyone has thought about how to wrap it in an ETP. Uh, we, we've, we've had some thoughts internally. That would be a very cool product, I think, if someone were to launch that. Yeah, I think to add there, I think everyone's looking at the yield space now, right? I mean, there's just so much opportunity there, not only on the DeFi side, but also on the, on the CeFi side. That's a way to potentially play uh, the yield space uh, for folks that maybe aren't as technically savvy or as comfortable. Um, so I think to Honey's point, maybe it's not maybe it's not the time where you're going to see ETPs around the yield space yet. Maybe that's, that's, you know, down, down the line. Uh, but I think in the meantime, private fund, uh, private fund strategies and other uh, less regulated vehicles that can give access to folks um, to the yield space is something that's really interesting. And we're definitely uh, looking at that very closely at three IQ. And I know many other asset managers in the, in the space are, are as well. There's just a lot of demand, especially in these interest rate environments, right? Super low interest rate environments, people are looking uh, constantly uh, for, for yield and the digital asset space has a lot of demand across the board. And, uh, you know, I just should chime in a little bit, um, James. I mean, I, I, you know, I've always been a student of sort of what's going on in the tech. I, I try to be a consumer, you know, I try to understand, you know, I, I'll, I'll download every app and every widget that I can find. Um, and, you know, you leave them sometimes for a couple of years and you come back and they've changed. And I've got to tell you, MetaMask is an incredibly, incredibly impressive product now. Um, they have done a phenomenal job on that. And, you know, not only do you have the wallet and, a, you know, send and receive capability, you now have a, a Web3 enabled browser in there that enables you to interact directly with all these DeFi platforms. So, you know, you can lie on your lounger and, you know, s you know spin your... US dollars from compound back to Aave, back to Binance, you know, it works. It works very, very well. It's not, yeah, at the end of the day, it's not any more difficult. It's actually easier than dealing with your HSBC account. Now, how you migrate people to that mindset. I mean, it's, it's incredible to me. I'm actually trying to raise some cash myself at the moment by, I got a bunch of coin share shares that are worth a lot and I'm trying to, you know, raise a bit of cash to do what I want to do. 
And, you know, negotiating with my bank is a joke. And it's been going on for six weeks and I've filled in 80 forms and I've gone back to head office like seven times in three conversations with compliance and like an x-ray. And yet I can deposit, you know, a lot of money on compound in a four second window and redeem it eight seconds later. And that's it. I mean, it's, 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 it's really stunning. So, you know, when we say it's complex, it's, it's not as complex as you think. It just doesn't have a distribution that, you know, people just don't know it's there. I mean, I wouldn't have known it was there myself six months ago. I agree completely with Danny on, on MetaMask, by the way. I think the uh, news recently came out that it had 5 million monthly active users, which I simultaneously, uh, and I think this isn't the only uh, opinion that, that would be shared on this. Uh, I simultaneously thought 5 million monthly active users is a lot more than I realized or I thought, but also how early is that? when you think about other networks and how much bigger um, it can still get. So MetaMask and, and the other things going on in the, in the ecosystem are really, really exciting and super early. Yeah, absolutely. And to our whole audience, you know, if you haven't already downloaded a MetaMask uh, application into your browser, then, you know, you really should try it out. It is incredible what's going on in the decentralized finance space. Um, I think we may be back uh, talking about DeFi shortly because it's just such an exciting topic. But, you know, I'm interested to, a, a little bit led by questions we've had coming in, go back to the structured products conversation, you know, what we're seeing um, through uh, 3IQ um, coin shares and, and 21 shares. You know, why would people put Bitcoin or invest, you know, through one of these ETPs instead of holding Bitcoin themselves? Um, you know, what are the benefits to that? That, that? That's a question that we've had come in. Yeah, I, I think we touched on that a little bit earlier, but to, to kind of expand on it, um, you know, I like Danny said, a lot of this stuff isn't super complicated. It's just different. And a lot of people don't know it's there um, and, and don't want to spend the time to figure out how to open up a Coinbase account or a Kraken account, and they don't want to learn how to how to custody these assets um, properly. Because honestly, there's not a ton of retail uh, custody options necessarily. Obviously, there more getting built out, and we have some folks on the panel here that are building out more solutions. But um, many of them are looking for a packaged product that they can access through the infrastructure they already have, and many of them are looking for that in tax advantage accounts. So in the U.S. You know, IRA accounts in Canada, uh, TFSA accounts. Um, folks want tax advantage exposure to this asset, and there's folks in the crypto space trying to make that easier. But the easiest way, I mean, is you already have a Fidelity account, you already have a, a BMO account, you already have a brokerage account in your traditional infrastructure, and whether you're a retail a participant or an institutional participant, now you can access Bitcoin and Ether and other assets. You know, with 21 shares, 10 plus, and coin shares in Europe, there's there's all of these different products out there that you can now access in the digital asset space without having to go through any of those hurdles or any of that friction to get that exposure, right? Um, so I think I think that's really the, the, the primary benefit of these products um, and, and just getting more people, more people into the space, right? Because plenty of people are going directly to, to, to Bitcoin, but there's plenty of people that haven't gotten over that hurdle yet and this is a, another way to get them there yeah that's that's such a good point and um, different levels different degrees of competency different interests different risk profiles um, and yeah, that makes a lot of sense thanks for that you guys have grown incredibly quickly um in your uh, canadian etfs you know what, what's the secret where's all the inflows coming from <laughs> Well, I think a, a couple points. Obviously, um, you know, we announced a, a joint venture with CoinShares. So the, the the Bitcoin product that we have is called the 3IQ CoinShares Bitcoin ETF. Um, one of the primary reasons we we forged that partnership with Danny and the team is because we, we both share a similar mission to bring uh, digital assets uh, and make them more accessible uh, through products like ETFs, right? And two of the largest digital asset managers in the space partnering up on something is, is, is a pretty uh, novel and uh, exciting thing in my mind. But, um, you know, there's 3IQ has been operating in Canada for a long time and so is, is very well uh, known and has a strong brand name for having digital asset expertise. Our, our other closed end exchange traded products already had a couple billion uh, in AUM across them before the, the launch of this ETF. 
So I think um, having that digital asset expertise, having that brand and, and, and distribution in Canada really allowed us when, when an ETF launched to attract significant institutional demand to the product. I, I would say that's probably where the majority of our, of our interest has come uh, through as of, as of now. Um, and that institutional demand, we've already touched on, Hani touched on it earlier, you know, uh, family offices and RAs, of course, but then also now you've seen the headlines, uh, large private bank platforms and broker dealers, like starting to look at the space and, and looking at what the, the options are to get exposure to the asset class. And obviously ETFs and, and ETPs are, are going to be top of that list for the benefits of, you know, why everyone focuses on ETFs, the liquidity profile, the 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 uh, ease of access, the the um, the the lower fees, you know, all, all of the reasons uh, the traditional markets have trended towards ETFs historically is is now playing out in the crypto space as well. Uh, I, I I I just you know I, I had a couple of other points to the same question, which is number one. The U.S. is a really big sandbox, right? And and something you know, something that's okay there is is, is probably going to do a lot better than something that's really good in Europe. That's just the way it is. Grayscale are, I'm not going to use the word I was going to use, but not doing a very good job. Um, and and clearly, you know, that's giving a bit of a suck for demand for product, which actually does track the price of Bitcoin and not the price of Bitcoin minus fifteen percent. Um, and finally, you know. What you know, one of the reasons we went public as a company was because what we found time and time again was that as new people, and that could be you know, business partners, joint venture partners, stakeholders, insurers, banks, as they come to the crypto space and they want to get involved in crypto, if they can get over the hurdle of I will, will invest in crypto, then what they're faced with is a bunch of companies they've probably never heard of before. Uh, for the most part, they've never heard of Galaxy. They've never heard of Coinbase. Probably for last week, you know, they never. And so, you know, one of the reasons we went public was because that, at least in terms of the counterparty that's associated with these products, both for ourselves, obviously, but also by association with Three IQ, it just checks a lot of boxes, and it, it, it it's kind of a, a rear end covering exercise, I think, for some people because you're asking them to jump through two hoops, right? You know, here's an esoteric asset class and a company, you know, that you don't know, and. Um, and, and so as more companies, I mean, there's a lot of companies listing now, two companies, two additional companies are listing on the same exchange, crypto companies listing on the same exchange that we listed on, one yesterday, one next week. And, and I think what you're going to see, you know, you've, just, you've seen the Invesco blockchain ETF index, which we're in, you've seen the Vanek blockchain index, uh, which we're not in yet. Um, but it's becoming, you know, this industry is becoming an industry and it's got constituent parts. And I think I think again, you know, the, uh, as you go up the scale in terms of institutional client, you know, that they're going to need a little bit more, uh, a little bit more comfort than you know, it's twenty five guys in a WeWork. Yeah, that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Um, and do you think that banks um, would partner with the likes of, you know, providers like yourselves to give access to their clients, or you know, would they be more likely to build these products themselves? Um, without giving too much away, they are partnering with us to give access to their clients because they, 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 they're too far behind the curve. They're too far behind the curve. In fact, they're doing it two ways. They're, 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 they have an appetite for product. They also have an appetite for connectivity, right? So that's so we're, we're finding increasingly, and this, that's going on a lot. I mean, I, I think God knows what Chad Cascarelli is doing at, 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 um, at the moment, but you know, after the PayPal deal, there's probably every payment process in America after him and all they want is connectivity you know they just want a, a deck that they can link up to their own platform and they can offer real-time pricing in crypto and it's going on those two ways both you know conventional type products but also through liquidity and connectivity yeah i, I agree and i think uh, you know it's one thing that that um you know uh these traditional platforms and broker dealers are getting involved in the space, even the launch of ETPs, right? In, in Canada, at least the way these products work are, you have to have authorized participants um, that, uh, that essentially are doing the creation and redemption of, of the shares, right? And those have to be regulated broker dealers. So those are in many cases, traditional uh, big names that you guys know, TD and BMO and, and all these high profile broker dealers that are now creating and redeeming, facilitating the creation and redemption of shares in, in a crypto product, right? And I think that's happening in many jurisdictions. And that 
act in and of itself, right, starts bringing these traditional parties into the ecosystem, right? They have to now learn how to hedge themselves because they're now market making on ETF products. And so they need to be interacting with Bitcoin in some way, whether it's through futures or through actually utilizing the underlier to hedge their positions. But that's a step in the right direction. And then separately, you've seen the headlines more and more broker dealer platforms are actually looking to add Bitcoin products like exchange traded products and private funds and all the other vehicles that are out there onto their platform because there's so much client demand, right? The, the price appreciation means that clients are calling uh, calling these their, their, their brokers on a daily basis saying, how do I get exposure to this, right? Because that's the, the infrastructure they have built out. And so that pressure is prompting these, these platforms to now really start to consider adding uh, Bitcoin solutions on there. So that's absolutely happening. That engagement is there. And I think we're just going to continue to see that momentum um, and, and more headlines uh, down, down the line. Um, do you have any view on uh, the relationship between fund inflows, so money coming into these products and, and the price? I mean, we've seen quite a close correlation over the last six months and obviously the gold market, uh, again, you know, any commodities markets uh, have quite a, a strong correlation. Do you think it's true that there, there's the same for Bitcoin? Of course, right? I, I mean, I think so. I don't know what I don't know what everyone else feels, but I, and Bitcoin and and a lot of these assets are driven by supply and demand. And so, when you have these fund vehicles, it comes back to what we talked about earlier: uh, bringing more people into the space that may not have been there already. Right now, you're attracting more assets into the ecosystem. And so, when you have ETPs that are launching and raising billions of dollars in assets. There's billions of dollars, depending on the structure, of course, but there's billions of dollars of, of Bitcoin, physical Bitcoin purchases happening behind the scenes that underlie these products. So that's naturally going to have long term implications to the price of, of Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's absolutely the more of these products that get launched, uh, the better. And I know the holy grail, everyone, what everyone's always talked about is the U.S. approving, you know, an ETF and that attracting a lot more assets. I think in some senses that that is true, will attract a lot more assets and there will be a lot of Bitcoin buying, which will be a, you know, a tailwind for, for the price of Bitcoin. I think that's a very healthy way of thinking about it. I, I, I think this is not a zero sum game. Um, everything here is absolutely complimentary. Like Danny's point on um, how DeFi benefits from Ethereum, he keeps having to go and buy more ETH. It's the same thing across the ecosystem. Uh, I, I, I fundamentally believe that what is good for DeFi is good for Bitcoin, is good for uh, Ethereum, is good for the entire ecosystem. We're creating a new industry. And in this specific case, a great tide will lift most boats. Um, and and that, that's a fairly unique situation to be in, but I think is the norm when something is being created from scratch. Something that really, um, you know, I think about quite often is the regulatory sort of um, look on crypto assets. And we've got a question here as well. You know, you, when you say a rising uh, tide lifts most boats, it's, it's very much true. So, it, you know, everything suddenly becomes, you know, an acceptable investment until it isn't. Um, so, you know, and, and at some point, that's where regulators are really going to get the bee in their bonnet is to say, look, there are, these are genuinely not... Um, projects creating utility that have like a, a dominant ecosystem. Um, so the question is, um, you know, what are the thoughts on when regulators will introduce um, better rules and standards um, around, you know, crypto and specifically uh, actually around custody of, of crypto? Look, um, when when we started this business, uh, you know, a couple of us sitting in a flat in, in, in Shoreditch with great ideas, uh, uh, drawing them out on, on paper, trying to build them. Uh, at that point already, we were very, very engaged with the regulators in order to try and get an understanding also what the landscape or the playing field is, you know, where, where are the boundaries, right? Um, and up to this day, it's, I mean, there is, there is a lot of movement, granted, uh, but what is not all to be forgotten is what the regulator's actual purpose is. And the regulator's purpose is there in order to protect the retail market. Uh, uh, that, is, that is what they are there for. 
um, given the rise of what we've seen in this space and, you know, due to what those three esteemed gentlemen and many others are doing, uh, um, us from an infrastructure perspective, is, is the fact that retail is getting more and more accessible to the space, which means that um, we reach the point now to the extent where I think that regulators can't stump in and uh, first and foremost, the approach needs to change, i.e. Uh, you shouldn't be trying to uh, um, squeeze a square pig through a round hole, right? Uh, uh, um, there needs to be a complete paradigm shift of how uh, this space should be operating uh, um, especially the underlying space, not 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 the products that are being issued already within the regulatory framework uh, uh, that is that is dictated on. But um, I don't see, we don't see a massive risk of any one of the major regulators barging in and basically trying to blow out the candle of the party. Uh, uh, um, I see the contrary happening very much so. I mean, the new head of the SEC is a is a pretty much a blockchain evangelist. Uh, uh, um, you have you have a, a lot of movement here with the FCA. You've got a lot of stuff happening in Asia in hubs like Singapore uh, and the like. So um, it will happen eventually. I mean, we all know that the regulator, unfortunately, is miles behind, uh, um, and he always will be behind. But that gives me also the right signal to the extent that they are very very wary and understandful of the fact that whatever regulatory framework they put in place is the core foundation that this whole industry is going to build up on and that needs to be extremely solid so um we i don't see any sort of risk of 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 uh, somebody barging in and saying guys that's just not happening um because everybody here uh, including us and many other players in that space are doing everything according to the rules already even though it is not in a regulated manner as such for all of us but uh, um that's very important to mention, I think. And between now and then that point where, you know, it is fully regulated, how does insurance like fit into fit into the picture? <laughs> well, um, yeah, the insurance market is a bit of a, a um, I basically said this two years ago, and it's actually still true. Uh, um, the insurance market is still extremely nascent. Uh, um, unfortunately, the um, the premiums that have been slapped on on uh, um, uh, um, in insurance policies uh, for this space are just exorbitantly high. Um, if you go down the cyber cyber route, uh, it is it is uh, it is a nightmare. I mean, I can uh, you you really pay somewhere above one percent uh, uh, for assets for assets held in terms of custody uh, 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 when it when it comes to when it comes to insurance, which of course from a standpoint, I mean, we are stamping out hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, going to the millions uh, uh, in, in, in terms of providing that from the outset. Um, but as soon as you put this in front of the asset manager and say, like, look, you want insurance, fair and square, um, you can go and get it. This is what it costs. Nobody wants to incur that headwind. So uh, um, it, is a, it is a very, um, the insurance industry has to step up massively, uh, um, given the fact that the security pieces, if, you, if things done properly, um, like from a security and risk perspective, things are, 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 are very, very minuscule. Uh, and you have you have experts in that field that are really providing the service like ours uh, um, that that can prove that on paper uh, uh, in, 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 in any shape or form. So it will happen. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the latest number is, but I think it's like 1.5 or $2 billion of insurable uh, uh, um, the insurance market is big right now. If you go to Lloyd's in London and you and you and you stand on on the on the, on the desks on the cyber desk, there is no money to be made. While J.P. Morgan is just renewing their contract for 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 160 billion. So this is that's that's where the problem is. Uh, so um, it will happen eventually, just like everything else. Brilliant, makes a lot of sense. Um, although hopefully this bull market has you know increase the rate that that they're looking at oh i'm sure it has increased the rate they're looking at this industry um okay so let's go to a couple of questions and then um from the audience um is there a reason is there ever a reason to use more than one crypto custodian for an etp um yeah we do that by by policy i think we we work with a total of six custodians there are multiple reasons to do so um and we think from a risk and diversification perspective, it can add benefits to the end investor. 
Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question about your the panel's view on synthetic assets. So uh, Mirror Protocol, for example, has Amazon stock and I think Apple and Tesla stocks. Um, I think most guys are going to about to run into a bit of a buzzsaw um, when you start making markets and securities online uh, with you know open access. I and mean, I think Barfin is already going after Binance now um, because of their some of their listings. Um, uh, that is probably stepping into an area you don't need to step into. With, and I don't know really for what reward because it's not like trading securities is very difficult. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I'd exercise a lot of caution with that. Speaking second. Um, okay. Jumping, just... jumping the gun, I think is the right. Uh, uh, jumping the gun, I think is the right word here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's some cool tech there that that I think longer term, you know, blockchain based securities trading, you know, that that's definitely exciting, definitely a use case. But I, I think Boris and Danny highlighted the concerns. It wouldn't surprise me, though, in the same way that NFT started taking off um, quite recently, despite being av available uh, for many years, that maybe security tokens um, start having a better future over the next couple of years. It's, um, I think the biggest problem with security tokens has always been on the uh, listing side. There's no good place to uh, list these. There's no good place with high liqu liquidity to have these. And a lot of the bigger exchanges that haven't gone into it, um, haven't needed, the, haven't wanted to get the necessary licenses to do so. And so uh, I agree with the other panelists' opinions. I, I do think that if that were to change, then uh, that entire picture could change very, very, very quickly. That also means, uh, and and look, we kind of, I, I think, are partially in this game all together uh, uh, because you know we 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 all come from traditional finance uh, and we have seen of what it means <laughs> when a trader pushes uh, uh, pushes through a trade uh, on on Monday. Uh, MT500 messages are being exchanged for two days. People run around the office having to chase Cassis and Boney in order to settle that trade two or three days later. It is, it is, it is a horrible, it is a horrible and archaic way of doing business. And blockchain is able to solve this. But again, we need to learn how to walk before we start running. And what you have there is that you have um, the JP Morgans and all the uh, Goldman Sachs and all those guys in the world that uh, uh, will potentially lead that way there. I mean, like two, three weeks ago, there was a big test run, I think, between Morgan Stanley and, 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 uh, and, and Credit Suisse. I don't know what it was in order to trade fixed income products that are, that are, that, that are listed. That was also with Sockchain and, and, and Santander. But uh, um, those are the first dabbled, uh, uh, you know, little baby steps in this space. Uh, uh, just trying to, like, wrap something around a Tesla stock because uh, um, Elon Musk is running around saying that Doge is the next best thing. Uh, to, in order to create a hype on the platform is not necessarily the way that you should take, uh, uh, again, down the regulatory route. And if it is a security, you have to do it according to the rule book. So uh, um, I'm fully with, um, I'm, I'm fully with, uh, um, with Buffin and any other regulator that, uh, um, that it's a little bit jump a gun. Yes, it's that classic uh, phrase we see around the space very often, which is should you be asking for permission or forgiveness? Um, and on that bombshell, we've just reached the hour, so we will uh, be leaving it there. I want to thank our fantastic panel so much for the discussion to Boris, Danny, Chris and Hanny. Um, and I would also like to mention our sponsors for today, Blockfills and Copper. And of course, to the uh, great team at Crypto Compare for making all of this happen.